begin. So I call the November 4th, 2024 Planning Commission to order at 7 p.m. Uh, first order of business is roll call. So I am present. I'm Chair Luke Marusiak, uh, Vice Chair Tessman. Present. Commissioner Smith. Here. Uh, Commissioner Kilcup. Uh, here she is. Commissioner present. Uh, we have uh, absence from Commissioner Crone. He notifies ahead of time. Uh, Commissioner Lambert said that he would be attending 10 minutes late. So uh, wait for that. And then Commissioner Murphy. Present. Very good. Okay, at this point, um, at the public comment section, I actually understand we have an introduction to do. Yes, thank you, Chair. <laughs> if we could call Mona Davis up to the podium, I'd like Mona to introduce herself. She's our newest addition. Thank you. Hi, I'm Mona Davis. I'm your new senior planner here. Excited to be working for the city of Snoqualmie and in uh, the community development department with Emily. So um, just kind of still getting my feet wet. My first day was last Monday, so I'm on the start of week two. So far, so good, but lots of, you know, downloading a lot of information right now, but Great. look forward to working with all of you. Excellent. And okay. uh, you're coming from? Uh, I came from Black Diamond. I was the community development director in Black Diamond for four oh. years. And then prior to that, I've got like 30 plus years of planning experience in other local jurisdictions. So Okay. All state of Washington? Uh, a short stint in Colorado. Oh, okay. So, yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Welcome. Thank Welcome. you. <laughs> Excited to be here. Yeah. We're Thank excited you. to have you. Thank you. Uh-huh. Great. And, um, okay. At this point, um, are there any uh, members of the public that wish to uh, make comments or items not on the agenda? Seen none. Move on to agenda approval. At this point, I move that we approve the November 4th agenda as written. Can I get a second? Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Agenda is approved. We go to the next agenda item, the council liaison report. Uh, greetings, uh, Planning Commission. Uh, I do not have anything specific to talk about tonight, but uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them as best I can. Okay, let me just do a quick poll so I don't uh, uh, miss anybody. Uh, mm -hmm. Vice Chair Tessman, any questions for Councilmember Johnson? Not tonight, thank you, Chair. Okay, Commissioner Smith? No, I don't believe so. Thank you for being here. Commissioner Kilcup? No questions for me, thank you. Mr. Murphy? No questions. Okay. It looks like you're off the hook, uh, <laughs> Councilmember Johnson. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Moving on to minutes. I move we approve the minutes dated October 21st, 2024, as written. Can I get a second? Can I get a second? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Those minutes are approved. And now we get to move to the. Um, Agenda item number two, the historic downtown retail district overlay code amendments. And I just want to formally thank, even though they're not present here, the six citizens uh, for attending and commenting on the uh, proposal on the table. And I also want to thank the staff for spending the last couple of weeks ensuring that we have clarity on every concern that was raised. And just to remind everybody, kind of a, a level set at 5,000 feet, uh, this originally came up when the Economic Development Board were concerned about preserving the character of downtown Snoqualmie. And one of the examples that we talked about a few times was that uh, at Center Street um, in on the Ridge, we actually lost a couple uh, nice retail areas. And we were concerned that if we didn't take some action that we'd wind up with a bunch of real estate offices and frosted windows. And so preservation is what this proposal does. Uh, the one thing that in the clarification, which is on page 24, which we actually may want to wade through it a little bit. Um, one of the things that caught me as an issue that I was not aware of is it does seem that the homeowners in the historic district were not happy to uh, be reminded that they are in a area that's zoned retail. I mean, that really seemed to be the 
the biggest pushback that they were given right now. So um, one thing I would like to do before we open up to discussion, since there were some, uh, you know, a lot of commentary, is refer you to page 24 of the packet that was out there and the FAQs. I think it bears just very quickly covering a few of those concerns that were raised by the comments in the six citizens that talked as well as some of the emails that came in. Um, so if you just indulge me, I'd like to cover a few of these comments, questions. Uh, so again, I'm on page 24 of the package. Um, and again, thank you for the staff for, for putting this together. So number one was how will the rezone retail uh, affect current property taxes? Will they increase the result of uh, retail zoning? And the, the short answer to all this is this proposal does not modify the underlying zoning of the parcels. I mean, I, I think we can stop there. Uh, the second question was, will current residents property owners be able to sell their homes or are they required to sell to a buyer to put retail in? And all existing ground floor residential uses are considered non-conforming under the current code. And that may have, that may have surprised some of these folks, but these uses, may continue to exist in perpetuity, including when a property containing non-conforming use is bought or sold, subject to provisions of SMC 17.55-040. If somebody wanted to raise their place and put up a, a McMansion, that would not that would not comply. But as far as keeping their homes and in the place, even though it's zoned as retail, that can continue. And number three, how will rezone affect the historic district overlay? It does not modify the underlying zoning of the parcels. And, um, and that was, you know, that was really the, I guess, a surprise for some folks. Uh, number four is many lots in question are small and retail building may require a teardown and rebuild. Um, so there was no teardown or rebuild mandated by the proposal. Uh, and then there was uh, some things that uh, I'm not going to talk about the emotion around these. I'll just calmly talk about these. Is this an attempt to dismantle the historic district? No. Modification to the SMC. 17.35 historic district overlay zones are proposed. There's no modifications to that. Um, homes and questions already have commercial residential zoning in place. What's the reason for shifting that? And again, maybe this was news to some of the homeowners, but this proposal does not modify the underlying zoning of the parcels. And if there was an issue that arose, I think it was a, a deep understanding of homeowners that they are in fact um, in a place that's zoned for retail. Number seven, is this an attempt to dismantle residential downtown to create condo retail buildings as a North End? Again, this proposal does not affect requirements that apply to existing or potential future residential uses in down, Snoqualmie's downtown. Is this, this is spot zoning, which is illegal. And the answer is no, spot zoning is generally characterized by parcel specific zoning. And uh, that's, not what, that's not what this is. Um, and then nine and 10, was uh, basically property owners, and again, these were primarily homeowners, were concerned that um, um, that if you removed the waiver process, that um, it would be a, a move to the city to reduce uh, <laughs> workload to property owners or um, could, could have some things. Again, what we're trying to do with the removal of the waiver is to make sure it stays with an elected officials and the coding, the character of downtown Snoqualmie. We don't want an expansion of, of the things that happened on the Center Street to happen in historic downtown Snoqualmie, whereas, again, you wind up with real estate offices and frosted windows. Uh, the 90 percent there was a concern about, uh, the 90 percent is aspirational, and that is something that we want to shoot for is, to, again, keep the character of downtown. Uh, number 11, uh, there was a concern about... Uh, uh, expanding the retail district overlay zone in downtown Snoqualmie and um, clarify the amendments to SMC 17.37.30.C, clarify that the ground floor retail use requirement does not apply to second story uses within the retail overlay zone. So again, that, that was a clarification that I don't know if it's fully understood. Uh, 12, tearing down houses, putting up four-story condos is not keeping with historic fill the neighborhood. Um, I mean, I almost not say agreed. Proposal doesn't modify the development standards. How will retail zoning affect property values? And that is not something that, um, again, there's no change in the zoning, but we can't forecast what happens to the property values. Can homes affected by a proposal continue to be used as residents? Yes, they can be used. 
uh, and exist in their current form. Uh, can use property both retail and residential. Properties affected by the proposal may be used for residential and retail purposes. However, pursuant to existing BR1, BR2 use, regulations, development standards, new residential, retail, or other uses are subject to those provisions. So again, big safeguard for the grandfather clauses. Uh, again, I think it's important just to, to finish these uh, FAQs at this point. So I'm on number 16 on page 27 of the package. Will the proposal limit the ability to rent out an ADU as an office or other use? As the case with all parcels, allowed uses are subject to zoning and use standards. The proposal does not modify these underlying zoning requirements, which I understand there are some ADUs in downtown. And uh, 17 non-conforming residential uses being added will skew 90% retail ratio, <clears throat> make it possible to achieve, preventing future non-retail uses from locating as part of the 10% allowance. The non-conforming uses supporting houses is defined and city-owned buildings are not included in the calculations of the 90% minimum retail use requirement, which also is aspirational. We recognize we're not there at this point in time. 18, non-conforming residential uses face issues expanding the footprint of their house. If the house falls out of a residential use for two years, it loses its non-conforming status. The proposal does not affect non-conforming use regulations within the city. Uh, new retail uses may overwhelm infrastructure. There is no new retail zoning proposed. And um, number 20, there is no need for additional retail space. Um, you know, comment noted, uh, understand, you know, we had comments about uh, expansion of retail and blight, uh, but again, there's no, uh, you know, there, there's no re new retail zoning. Uh, stakeholder meetings included only merchants, did not notice <laughs> residential commercial property owners. If you look at the explanation of the six bullets on the right, uh, there were merchant meetings, there were Ridge merchant meetings, there was a mailing notice in June to all property owners, there were uh, two online information sessions in June, uh, notice to all property owners, and in October, there was a mailing notice uh, on the public hearing, and then on the 21st, we had the public hearing. So I do believe that, um, again, my summary, and I'm going to do a roundtable, but I want to go through that process. Uh, but my summary is that um, there was, you know, good news is the biggest concerns that the residents had uh, of their worst fears, um, there is no, there's no rezoning. There's no, you know, thing on the proposal there that uh, has their biggest concerns. The thing that came up that was somewhat new is that, again, the homeowners downtown are not happy that they're in an area zoned as retail. And that is... That is where that is. So it just covered the 21 points that we've got here. Um, and I did that kind of rapid fire. I do want to go around the commissioners. Hopefully we've had a chance to digest uh, what we heard back in October and then see if there's any additional uh, comments or discussion um, to add to this conversation. So I'm gonna start um, online, Vice Chair Tessman. <coughs> Yeah, thanks, Chair. Uh, just a couple of things. One, thank you so much to the staff for putting this concise document together. I think it helps not only the public, probably the most important thing, but also this commission, right? It's been a lot of different meetings. It's a, it's a fairly meaty subject, and so I'm super appreciative of it. And, uh, and I would echo the Chair's comments. Thank you to the public for being engaged on this one. Um, a lot of topics we don't get that so super super thankful for that the public comments did make me concerned and i and that's why i went back to the agenda packet to see staff's work to confirm that non-conforming uh use uh essentially ex exemption so uh i get i think that gets to the heart of the public's concern um and really it's it's uh it's no change to them uh, or the investments that they've made. However, we are setting the stage, you know, for that growth in retail that we, uh, you know, that we envision. So I think it's the right move, uh, balancing all factors. And so thank you, staff. That's all I have. All right. Thank you, Vice Chair Tessman. Uh, Commissioner Smith. Yeah, I think I think that was that was well put. I. I do think as as I reflect on some of the the feedback that was received via email and what we heard last week, there's there, there is a bit of a 
maybe a public perception challenge that that we have to work through. And and I, I think that's the royal we. I, I don't know that we as the planning commission are the right body for that, but I think as as we put forward any any recommendation, if we do so to the city council and others, I think it's really incumbent upon them to make sure they're clarifying these issues with the public um, because it's it's clear there's you know, there's maybe a little bit of there's, there's there's obviously a lot of concern. There's a bit of distrust, I think, with 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 what has gone through with the rails project coming coming through. Uh, it's understandable where they're coming from. And I, I, I think this lays it out very well, what's been presented by staff. So thank you for that. It it reassured me, I think, from what we heard last week or last time and kind of thinking like, well, that's that, this is not at all what we've been talking about. This sounds much broader, but, you know, going back, looking at the red line changes again to propose changes to the municipal code and, and everything that's been outlined here, I, I do think that this, this is in line with what we have been discussing. Um, but I would hope that the city spends a, a good effort as this proceeds to uh, communicate with the community and, and, really talk through some of these issues and concerns to make sure that that's that's understood agreed agreed thank you thank you commissioner smith uh commissioner coco yes i would only echo what has we, been said you, thank you for you can, barely you. Hear you. can you hear me yep okay yes. sorry i i'm having a mic issue um <laughs> Thank you to the staff for putting that together thank you to the citizens that showed up that was really okay, helpful I'll, I'll uh, and I do think that it illuminated also to Commissioner Smith's points some uh, things that we need to be aware of in terms of that communication and um, just public sentiment towards what we're working towards right now. So um, I just, no new comments, just well put. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Coke up. Uh, Commissioner Murphy. Yeah, a couple of just, you know, last week's um, hearing just made it like really apparent for me to make sure that we're like dotting the I's and crossing the T's on the public outreach and um, making sure that like we are kind of meeting the public where they are and, um, you know, walking them through um, this, I think was really important. So I think that's where that, the document that the staff put together was great. Um, and I think, um, I, I, I hope and, and wish that the folks that were here last week can, can see that, review that, and hopefully that allays some of their concerns. One of the questions I had, and this, might, and this may have predated my time on the commission, so if that's the case, apologies. And it's actually a question, question from Mr. Levins um, related to the outreach to tenants on Center Street. And I just want to, I'm all in favor of obviously the, um, the the non frosted window um, kind of um, provision we have, but I also I also want to make sure that if and when this put, is put forward to the city council, um, there has been appropriate outreach to the tenants of those properties that if their windows are not currently in compliance, that they they are at least aware that something is coming down the pipe on this. So if this came about before I jumped on, please correct me and let me know. But that was just one question I had as we were going through it. I was trying to thinking, uh, thinking of like, okay, have we, has, is every, are, are we not, are we not putting, are we, um, no, no surprises, I guess, for the public or for the, the tenants out there. So that, I guess, a question for, for Andrew there or others. Yeah, thank you. I think that's a, Thoughtful question, um, especially given how sensitive, uh, you know, the public has been to some of the um, things that are proposed in this text. So I think it's, I think um, a thoughtful outreach approach is definitely warranted as this continues to move forward, should it continue to move forward. Um, to answer your question, I, I would have to verify this with um, other city staff, but my understanding would be that the Transparency requirements would not necessarily apply to um, existing uses. However, moving forward, uh, they these these requirements would apply. And it's we I I believe that we did reach out to the um, landlords 
of the uh i should say the owners of the uh buildings on center center boulevard and i think it's um maybe two or three large um corporate uh like land holding companies that own the properties and as i recall they did not respond and they also do not participate to my knowledge in the ridge merchants meeting um but we also outside of that ridge merchants meeting did not conduct a uh, tenant specific outreach on center boulevard so it's definitely worth uh considering how they can be incorporated moving forward and be aware yeah i mean i think like we're in i don't i don't want to like pump the brakes unnecessarily and i think that like the spirit of what we're doing is right i just want to make sure that um those tenants aren't caught for a loop right and i think like I, I just was going down i was walking down center street the other or this weekend and you know pineapple life is an example where they have like one window that's you know where it's oh you know totally clear about 75 percent, and another where it's completely opaque right and i don't i, I hmm. want to make sure that at least like as you said andrew like the existing tenants maybe it's not an issue right it's it's something that it doesn't impact them it's only for like future and new um new tenants that are coming in center street. Uh, so that clarification I think is important. And if it is impacting existing, then obviously we want to um, make sure that all those like small business owners are just like aware of what's, uh, of what's going on. So that was my only, everything else I think was really, I think thoughtfully addressed by the chair and by the staff um, here, but that was like the one piece I want to make sure that we're making sure we're over communicating to um, to our small business owners in the community. Councilmember Johnson? Yeah, also just uh, was thinking along the lines of uh, windows that are kind of blocked off. Uh, the intent here, my understanding, is to try to increase the retail use rather than, say, doctor's offices. But that said, if it's a medical. <laughs> <laughs> um use right now we probably don't want to have the windows wide open <laughs> uh so people walking by are looking on people's um medical examinations so that's probably a good reason to have the windows closed off but i think the intent right is to increase our retail use so that it's less of that um and then uh i did have one other question that is in terms of having someone uh a property owner required to fill the space with the retail uh, would that come into play, let's say, if it's a building where they want to do a complete remodel, knock the whole thing down, leave up maybe a wall so they can call it a remodel or whatever the rules are for that. Um, but basically, they're completely redoing the structure. Is it, it, At that point, would the retail requirement kick in or at what point could it uh, to try to increase this up to the 90%? Change of use. So it would only be in the case of a change of use that the new requirement would come into play change of use um maybe we should maybe i should think about that for a minute because it might be at the time of a change of a new owner as well hmm. okay. um we, we, yeah andrew do you have a response on that yeah director Arteche, i believe if i'm understanding the question correctly are could an example be um like a, a residential home um and then once it's changed uh to a retail use how would those regulations apply when do they kick in is that i guess yeah. the question so that's, right. that's that's correct the remodel itself would not necessarily have um a bearing on that that kind of comes into play with the non-conforming use or non-conforming structure standards so like if your structure is not sufficiently set back um for example if you had a major remodel you might be required to address that deficiency uh as part of your remodel but that's all governed by the non-conforming use code which we're not really um proposing any changes to at this point however i believe the director is correct when that and this is also a part of the non-conforming use standards when that uh uh, use when that building falls out of that use. So for example, if a um, single family home were to cease to be a single family, cease to be used as a, as a residential use for a period of two years under the non-conforming use code, 
it would lose its non-conforming status and then be subject to these retail use requirements um, for all ground floor uh, storefronts facing the street. And then one little follow up, if I may. Please. Then uh, let's say that that did occur, but the building is insufficient for various reasons to be retail. Um, over the two-year period, would the owner of the building be required to make changes such that it could become retail? Uh, would they be required to run it as retail anyway, even though it's not really set up that way? Uh, so how exactly would that work? It's hard to uh, speak definitively in a hypothetical situation, but I do believe the answer is yes, that that uh, that person would be under this code required or that structure, that building, once it fell out of that residential use and lost its non-conforming status, it would be then required to either find and a so we're only talking again about ground floor uses facing the street. Um, it would be required to either find a qualifying retail use as part of the 90% or wait until an opening um, arose in that 10%. And even in that case, it would still only be allowed to have a use that is permitted or conditionally permitted in the BR1 or BR2 zone. Thank you. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Can I do one other thing? Okay. Uh, yeah. So then uh, under the current code, the way that it is, what are the percentages? And is that any different from what is currently in place? Apart from the percentage. The retail percentages? Yes. Yeah. 75, 25. Okay. So right now it's 75. But even under the current code as it is now, that two-year thing would still be the same. So that isn't changing. The only thing that's really changing with regard to ownership would be the change in the percentage. Is that correct? That's my understanding. You said two year thing? Yes, the two years, uh, if it was um, not being used as let's say a, um, a residential unit for two years, mm. under the current code, that is still the case that they would have to then uh, become, they would have to conform to the code that's in place now um, instead correct. of being non-conforming. Right. So yes, that's basically correct. that didn't yeah. change. Thank you. <laughs> okay. And I see that uh, Commissioner uh, Lambert has joined. Uh, Commissioner Lambert, I don't know how much of the discussion you had. We actually covered the 21 FAQs uh, to address uh, the public uh, uh, hearing that we had. But uh, do you have any uh, comments at this point? I guess we do have a couple questions. What about with the person in that in the residential zone that is under the new code uh, does an Airbnb for their property for the next two years. How would that affect that? Is it still residential at that point in time? Um, I would have to check the uh, the use table. I'm not sure. Uh, I mean, typically I'm not sure off the top of my head what Snoqualmie's short-term use regulations are. Um, I'm not sure if somebody else on staff can speak to that. But if it is, typically a short-term rental would not be considered as a um, a residential use. But it would. It just depends on the circumstances surrounding that precise scenario um, and the interpretation of the non-conforming use code as it applies to it. We, we could get back uh, an answer okay. to that question. So we'll, uh, staff will get back to, to answer the question on Airbnb. Is there a, a, a follow up on that uh, topic, uh, Commissioner Lambert? Uh, not specifically on Airbnb, um, but I did have another question about, I, I'm a little confused. The 90% that we're aiming for is 90% of those spaces that are businesses not including the non-conforming use residents. Is that correct? That's how you stated it here, but that's not how we discussed it when we thought, when we talked about it originally. So currently that I believe uh, as you've stated it, that's how the that's been the practice of how the city's applied the current 
uh, regulation, the with uh, with the seventy five percent being retail, twenty five percent being non retail uses, subject to the underlying zone. Um, moving forward, if it is the commission's desire to recommend that that practice be changed, that's certainly a, mo a modification that we can include in the strike through. Um, however, to the commenter's point. Um, the introduction of a, a large number of non-conforming uses into that calculation of the ratio would um, skew that, could skew that calculation potentially in, indefinitely because many of these non-conforming uses can exist in perpetuity unless they fall out of their non-conforming status. That's the way it was discussed when we discussed it for months before the public comment, just FYI. Um, that the non-conforming use would be counted in that 90 percent. Uh, if that's some, I think then um, we, if that's the case, we should definitely uh, examine how that can be incorporated into the strike through because I don't think it's uh, been reflected uh, very clearly in what we've prepared so far. All right. I think those are my two questions for now. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, at this point, uh, perhaps it would be good if, uh, Andrew, you could go over the uh, strike throughs on the proposed uh, code changes. Yes, I'd be happy to. Thank you, Chair. So starting off um, up at the beginning of the chapter, um, th uh, this is the chapter describing um, the intent of the uh, BR1 and BR2 zone. Here we have modified these zones to um, reflect the fact that the, the retail overlay zone is going to be expanded to also encompass the BR2 zone. And so these changes were made just for the sake of internal consistency. And please feel free to stop me at any time. Additionally, we have, so moving down in the actual uh, downtown historic district retail overlay zone chapter, chapter 17.37 uh, in the Snoqualmie Municipal Code. Previously, the boundary of the overlay zone was described in a verbal format. We are proposing for the sake of clarity to remove uh, this description because it would be quite lengthy and hard to interpret and simply depicted on the official zoning map. Which is attached here. <laughs> and um, then moving down into subsection or into section uh, 030 of that chapter, here is where we modified the ratio to reflect a 90% requirement in the BR1 and BR2 zone, uh, which is now the BR2 is now included in that, uh, allowing only 10% of storefronts to be occupied by non-retail uses. And we, um, instead of qualifying this only as Railroad Avenue, because now there's more than one street in the overlay zone, it's any building any premise with a separate entrance in the retail overlay zone. And here we have exempted permanent supportive housing, trans, uh, transitional housing and emergency housing, as well as the city occupied buildings in the retail overlay zone from that ratio requirement. Uh, I would, um, if, if there, if it is the intent to, um, include non-conforming uses into the calculation of this requirement for the just purpose of clarity, I would suggest that uh, we uh, consider, well, if the director agrees uh, that we consider 
including some language to that effect, just so this is the interpretation of, um, or the application of this ratio is um, clear to the public moving forward. Um, These are just more, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, so um, to uh, Commissioner Lambert's point, um, how would how would that work? You'd add another sentence here to basically say, for support houses, transitional housing, and existing non-conforming houses would not be included. Something like that. Or so, will not if, be unless I'm mistaken, I believe Commissioner Lambert's statement um, was to include the non-conforming uses not exclude them as these other uses are here in the calculation. So uh, for example, if we add an existing single family residence into, um, into the retail overlay zone, then that will count against the 10%. Whereas I believe the practice up to this point, and um, please correct me if I'm wrong, Director Oteche, but I believe non-conforming uses have not been included in this 10% calculation. So if it were to be included, um, we would we would call out the fact somewhere in this paragraph in the subsection A that non-conforming uses uh, count towards the 10%, Wait. and they don't. Yes, uh, um, director excuse Kitchen. me, Andrew. I, I was just saying, I think that Andrew and I should go back and just fa fact check that. Okay. Um, you know, to see um, right now we have a list of, of everybody in the retail district overlay and we know who's retail and who's not retail. Right. And that's how the 75 um, and, and 10% are, or 75 and 25% are Currently. calculated. Um, I'm not sure that it makes any difference if it's legal non-conforming. It, it's it's been that way. These properties are retail right now, BR one or BR two. Um, you know, so um, to exclude them from the you know calculation of having retail instead of one of the other uh, permitted uses in BR two, I think we should should go back and fact check that. Okay, and right. in fact, the uh, you know a reminder: the ninety percent is aspirational. It could be it could be you know, a decade or plus. Yeah, it's actually. aspirational. If, if if you didn't want to be aspirational, um, then you could say everybody that ha is, has a legal non-conforming use in the BR1, BR2 is excluded from the calculation. But if you wanted to be aspirational, you'd say, okay, every, everybody is subject to, within this boundary, to the retail district overlay. And it may take many years, may take 10 years to get that. Maybe nobody ever sells their home. Yeah to a, a business owner that wants to convert it to a business. But some business owner, some homes on Falls Avenue have flipped over to retail use. They still look like a house, but there's a business in there. Okay. So the, the fact check is, is the non-conforming residents um, included or excluded from the current 75-25? Uh, that's the that's the deal. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we'll get the fact check on that. And uh, just want to uh, post check with uh, Commissioner Lambert. Is that uh, clarification? Will that give you what you need for to answer your question? Yeah, I do want clarification on that. And just to be clear, I was not advocating for this. I want I just wanted clarity because okay. when we discussed it initially, it was that the non-conforming uses were part of that ninety yeah. percent or the ten percent, whatever it was. Okay. Yes. Gotcha. Okay. So action there to clarify that. Go ahead, Andrew, keep, continue. Thank you. Um, these are just more housekeeping changes here in subsection B. Uh, this, this section is, this subsection C is of note because it is the subject of one of the comments that uh, just misunderstood, I think, uh, that the retail use requirement does not. This text would exempt second store uses from the retail use requirement. Um, so I think this 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 um, should satisfy that concern. Or um, and then here is the deletion of the retail waiver process and qualifications. Uh, the commission decided that. 
um, no waiver process is the preferable alternative for their recommendations. So we've removed these sections. And then now we're moving on to the Snoqualmie Ridge 2 development, or I'm sorry, Snoqualmie Ridge 1 development standards for the neighborhood center. Um, here in section 12E.040C, we are instituting the 90% requirement uh, for ground floor tenant spaces for all storefronts facing Center Boulevard Southeast. Uh, that's an increase from the prior requirement, which was only applicable to corner tenant spaces along Center Boulevard um, at facing intersections. Um, we've also struck the, in subsection D, we've struck the waiver process from the Ridge standards as well. And then moving down into kind of like development storefront standards, design standards, we've added that provision requiring that no more than 50% of a ground floor uh, window of a retail use can be covered with an opaque material or basically block visual access into that space. And that's to encourage um, a more vibrant pedestrian experience. And then here's the map of what uh, the black line being what is currently the extent of the retail overlay zone and then the proposed extent, which encompasses the BR1 and BR2 zone downtown. And then you can see here we have the corner spaces facing the intersections on Center Boulevard Southeast, and then the expansion of the extent to encompass um, all buildings facing Center Boulevard Southeast. And then lastly, just the list of retail uses this, or I'm sorry, the uh, uses that are allowed in the BR1 and the BR2 zone. We included this attachment uh, and it's kind of remained in the packet, but it was used uh, for the purposes of determining whether or not BR1 and BR2 would continue to exist as separate zones or whether they would be combined. Ultimately, um, through a lot of discussion, uh, the commission decided that their recommendation would um, be to continue having two distinct zones. And then now we're down into the packet material. So I'm happy, or I'm sorry, the Q&A material. So I'm happy to answer any questions or go back over anything. We do a, a quick poll. If we've got a chance to see if there's any further questions of clarification in addition to the um, 17.37.3030A clarification and that we've already noted. So um, Vice Chair Tessman, any questions or clarifications? Mr. Sure, Levin. thank you. I'm good. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Smith? No further questions right now. Commissioner Kilka? No further questions. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Lambert? No further questions. Commissioner Murphy? Uh, yeah, one clarifying question. And again, uh, apologies as this may be predated my time on the commission, but when we went, when the commission and staff were aligning on the boundary of the, the new boundary of the retail overlay zone. And I, I'm going back to the comments last week and they were almost all exclusively residents of Naples. Um, I think maybe with an exception of um, um, one individual. And um, I'm wondering um, if, what I, I want love to get some insight into the background of the inclusion of, of Maple in the kind of retail overlay zone expansion. Is it just because that was BR two and it was it was easier to do it that way? Whether there's are there other reasons just to kind of get a sense of that? Because I think um, I want to just provide a little more context for the residents of Maple who were here last week in terms of like why are we including Maple. Um, as part of this falls, like, you know, you can make a good, a good case for obviously railroad, um, wanted to maybe just open that up to staff or to the chair or folks on the commission for kind of some of that clarification. Okay. A Andrew, you want to start? Sure. Uh, thank you. Yeah. I, to answer your question, I think, uh, the precise boundary evolved over time. Initially, 
it did just include um, the parcels facing Falls Avenue. Uh, and I don't even believe these ones over on River Street were included in the um, what was initially contemplated for the retail overlay zone expansion. But as uh, I think, I think, you know, it's been echoed a lot here tonight. I think the um, kind of aspirational view was that these districts, which are already zoned for, um, you know, retail uses could someday um, evolve into kind of an extension that's comparable and enhances uh, the experience along Railroad Avenue and falls and complements it in a nice way. Um, so that's uh, kind of from a staff perspective, I think how we got from just Falls Avenue to en encompass also um, the entirety of the BR2 zone. Um, but I would let the commissioners speak for themselves uh, for for their feelings. Yeah, no, that's pretty accurate. I mean, the thought was if you have it as already zoned that way, it was already as BR2, why not just include that in the in the overlay so that uh, we're consistent, consistent across there? And, and we did understand that it would be, uh, it would need to be an aspirational percentage because of the existing home there. That discussion came up. Got it. Okay. So um, anybody, any commissioner, or staff on that, anything else? Or is that? That's fine. Okay. Okay, uh, Commissioner Murphy, anything else? No, nope, that's it. Okay, then at this point, um, we'll look for clarification from staff, and hopefully we can get that uh, between now and the next meeting, and I think we'll be uh, ready to, to see if uh, any further discussion and uh, refer it to the council at that point. Okay? Thank you. Okay. All right. Now we move on to another non-controversial uh, topic, the critical areas ordinance update. Yes, we have our senior wetland biologist, Jeff Gray, available to bring back some information that was requested from our last meeting with regards to buffer sizes and increased buffers and riparian corridors. Yes, and, and uh, Ms. Gray, we're- uh... Jeff, are you there? I, I am. Right. So we're going to give you uh, 12 minutes, Jeff. Can you do it in 12 minutes? I'll do it in less. Okay. Half, right. half as much as last time. All right. Yeah, so as a brief reminder, um, proposing to increase widths, um, stream buffers previously, or I guess will we'll be changed to riparian management zones. And so on fish bearing streams, uh, buffers will go from 75 to 200 feet. And on non-fish bearing streams, uh, buffers will go from 50 to 100. So um, <clears throat> at the last meeting, um, more information was requested on the changes and the impacts to the city. And so we did a little GIS exercise to provide some metrics to those changes. Um, and I also prepared two exhibits that I think were included with the packet, and I can share those um, quickly here. Let me figure out. <coughs> so... All right. Um, sure. There it is. Okay. Um, can folks see that? Not yet. There we go. All right. So um, first question was how many um, or how much fish bearing streams and how much non fish bearing streams are within the city. And so what we did is we just we merged the urban growth boundaries with the city boundaries that's the black line that goes around the outside the red lines are the fish bearing streams the black lines are non-fish bearing streams and the blue lines are shorelines we're not proposing any changes to the shorelines um, so there's no stream up for widths, vegetation, setbacks, anything like that within the green area. The green is a shoreline, uh, shoreline boundary. So, um, so that's sort of just an exhibit of the streams within the city and urban growth area limits. Um, and then we started to calculate what the changes would entail. So, um, we created figure two. 
And can folks see figure two? Yes. All right. So uh, and I'm going to zoom in to show you what we did because it's probably hard at the scale that you're seeing it. So what we did is we applied the standard 75 foot buffer along each of the streams. Um, and then we added a 200 foot buffer, removed the 75 foot and the Delta 125. And so we basically added up all the additional area that would be encumbered by this code change. We did the same thing for non-fish bearing streams. That's the black lines where they had an existing buffer of 25 or 50 feet. We used 50 for this exercise. We expanded it to 100. And so the hashed lines are basically the buffer increase. Um, and I'll zoom back out again here. So what that looks like is an additional uh, buffer area within city limits, I think totaling about 550 acres would be, would be encumbered. And the other metric that I was asked to pursue was the number of structures. And the number of structures is we, after we made this mapping, we literally went through each drainage and wherever there is a structure that was um, overlapping with the increased hatch area, the increased buffer, we counted it as one, and we counted up to 175 structures. Yeah. So we, we did try to stay true to the code, where uh, if there's intervening roadways or other development, buffers do not extend beyond that. Um, we tried to get you know as close as accurate as an estimate as we could uh, using these methods. So, so 175 structures looks like most of it on the ridge and a little bit down in what is we call so call me west um are would be in a non-conforming area based on the new standards is that correct the correct new... yeah and so i and so i put this on the aerial background to help kind of with the visual a lot of you know a lot of these areas are you know currently, you know, not encumbered or not developed, but there is overlap. So hopefully that's the visual is easy to pick those areas up. <clears throat> you know, and I think some of this, especially like in the SR2 area, you know, I think some of this, there's SR2 was vested under smaller buffers. The streams are still there, but now you know, the development agreement, things like that for SR2 has expired um, or other agreements where there's been shorter buffers and now allowed to develop. And then using this new buffers after those DAs have expired would, you know, encumber those properties potentially. What does that mean, encumber those properties? Well, uh, they'd be legally non-conforming. So, um, so say somebody wanted to put a deck you know, you know, on the back of their house. Uh, previously, it might not have been in a buffer, but now it would have been. So then you'd be expanding the legally non-conforming mm. use, which then you cannot do. So you couldn't theoretically put the buffer or put the deck on the back of your house if the, you know, if the buffer now went through, say, the center of your house. Mm. Okay. And um, uh, what about um, the commercial area? How, how would that apply to commercial buildings? It, it looks like a few of those are impacted too down there. So for downtown? No, no, and uh, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. And the SR two, I I don't know the difference between residential and commercial. Okay. We just uh, move, move your cursor straight down. You see those larger buildings? Keep moving down. Okay, now move it up that that red line. Yep. Now some of those larger buildings there are commercial. Yeah, so the developed footprint, you know, goes along here. Right. Um, so any future development would be allowed to redevelop within that existing developed footprint. So they just can't expand further towards the stream. So even though we would be increasing the buffer, they still have the redevelopment rights. They still have, um, you know, the existing uses. Um, they just can't expand further south towards the stream from the footprint that's already there. Hmm. So it's not like... You know, you sell the property, and then all of a sudden, you have to rip up all the all the concrete, and then or pavement, and then develop 
you know, further away, um, there would be redevelopment rights within the existing footprint. Is how it's usually done. I have a question. Uh, yes. Uh, excuse me, Councilmember Johnson. Yeah, I was curious along the um, that kind of bite that's taken out uh, at the southern end of town there, um, where uh, there's the a lot of red, and then it kind of runs into a black section. Um, and then there's kind of like a red dot that's kind of isolated in the middle, uh, north of there. Um, yeah. Right here. North. Keep yeah. going north. There we go. Along that big red blotch there. If you keep following it to the west, keep following it. Okay. There it stops. And then it's like upstream. There's a blotch of fish that exists there. And then there's a blotch of the fish, mm -hmm. the a fish that appear further upstream. Just trying to understand exactly how that works. Um, yep. Yeah. So, no, it's a, it's a good question. We noticed it too. Um, so we use the King County streams layer um, for the mapping purposes. It's kind of its available data source, mm -hmm. but the stream goes outside of the city boundaries, kind of overlaps the city boundaries and then goes back outside the city boundaries. That's why. So, um, so this is the city boundary, this black line, um, which is not clear now that I'm looking at it. We use two black lines. But that is the uh, city boundary. And then that little red part right there is where there's a little bit of that fish bearing stream that it, uh, is mapped within city limits. All right. so, yeah, That's kind that, of what I expect. I just want to make sure. Yeah, no, that is confusing now that you pointed out. Sure. Yes. Can I ask a question? Yeah, um, so go ahead. Uh, yeah that's a good point. Um, Jeff, are you able to tell the commission what the county buffer size is for that stream did they already do their cao update um i i i don't know off the top of my head um uh what king county's buffer widths are right now but i i, I and i you know when from on, on other projects when you have a, a, a stream that has a buffer that extends across jurisdictions like a city boundary you know it's up to the city in which the development is occurring to either you know adopt the county's code or just say you know it's not encumbered because it crosses the city limits so everyone's on a case-by-case -case basis it's happened a couple times in my career not very often mm -hmm. and and that uh that red area in the commercial district. I mean, that's there's a business loop trail there. Um, yeah, that uh, stream, such as it is, it is like a is like a trickle in the ditch in the summer, and then it bubbles up a little bit. Yeah, I'm amazed that uh, that's a fish bearing stream. But uh, I'll take a little closer look at it. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. So these, you know, this is based on you know the available data set. You know, we didn't have time to sort of proof you know, proof it there, the DFW and the city does have a pretty, um, I say, you know, a broad definition of fish habitat. So, um, you know, there's certain criteria that's in the whack that how you do the stream typing. And so, um, and there's also seasonal streams. So even if it's dry in the summer, it could be fish bearing in the winter and things like that. There's a seasonality aspect. No, no, I hear what you're saying. I hear what you're saying. Okay. Um, all right. I understand what's the impact. I'm kind of surprised at all the impact and the implication would be that it would be a, a non-conforming use that would prevent expansion and um, basically similar to non-conforming use we were talking about earlier. Hmm, interesting. And where it is undeveloped, it would not be able to be developed. Correct um yeah I mean, there's and there's different tools like there's like there's either buffer averaging there's there's things you can play with on a case-by-case -case to kind of eke out a little bit of a development you know developable area on a parcel but that's on a case-by-case -case. you know trails i think is an allowed use in the buffer things like that all right and then uh, just uh, for clarification of the uh, what would we say 150 plus uh properties that are affected um what would happen to those short term? They'd just be in a non-conforming area at this point. In short order, nothing would happen to them. Um, mm -hmm. But if they came in and said, "Hey, uh, I'd like to expand my residential home," you know, closer to the critical area, we'd say, "No, right. you can't." 
you're right. in above you you're encroaching upon a buffer right right okay so it only impact a expansion yeah i mean the city wouldn't be able to do anything about the new buffer being placed on a previously platted lot you know okay and then the cases where it's not developed it would prevent uh further development it w could prevent or limit development but like um jeff had mentioned there are tools in the critical area ordinance that allow some development to occur within critical areas and or buffers okay and the area in green because it's under shoreline is uh, is primarily free and clear although you got some you got some red in there yeah, te yeah I just, technically yeah, I, oh, I was gonna say technically chris we're just talking about a 200 foot from the ordinary high within the shoreline jurisdiction. Correct, and that's on type S streams. So that's the blue S, those are the shoreline designated streams. And what, what I did notice is that say the, um, what's it called, the dirt fish rally school, the old mill pond site, um, you know, there are fish bearing streams that are beyond the 200 feet from the ordinary high water and then so a stream like this, a, a fish bearing stream within shoreline would have a 200 foot. And uh, um, and so you can't have a type F stream within shoreline jurisdiction that's not a type S stream is because shoreline jurisdiction extends to the broad floodplain. Okay. Oh, shoreline a jurisdiction um, extend to, extends to the floodplain? Is that what you said? Yeah, the green is where the f uh, shoreline management plan jurisdiction is. We pulled that from um, from King County, I believe. Okay. I see a hand up with Commissioner Kilcup. Yes. Um, the question I had was regarding if, if we were to move forward with these um, extended buffers, just clarification between, are we saying that a non-conforming use could not move closer towards the buffer in like lineal feet, or are we saying that those properties would not be able to expand square footage in any way? Both. Okay. It, with some exceptions, I mean, I think it, it, it depends on exactly what the person's gonna do, but if they wanna build closer to the critical area and or buffer, they'd have to demonstrate first that they could avoid that by going up or going the other direction. Right, I, I understand us not wanting them to come closer to the buffer, um, just given that that is touching on some, especially commercial properties, although I'm not sure how different it would be for residences. That does seem a bit concerning mm -hmm. um, that we would be restricting their properties that way. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, thinking, Thinking about communication, um, how does how would the city communicate this to the affected residences? Or would it not need to be communicated? I mean, it have to be communicated in some way, right? Typically, we wouldn't notify every single property owner and tell them that the critical areas ordinance is being updated, and you know your property portion of your property may be within a, a buffer um, at the time of development we'd say oh you're close to a critical area show us where you want to build tell us where the the critical area buffer is located stay outside of the critical area buffer that's what we would do okay so it's basically at this point it's as is right the, the yeah. built, built stuff is built and um expansions it, it would come into impact if expansions were it, yeah, and the critical areas, it, it, it changes over time. I mean, critical areas move, they grow, they expand. Um, so even if we didn't have these buffers and they were in proximity to a critical area, we'd say, show us where your critical area is and show us where the buffer ends. And then, you know, then you, you know where you could build up to. Okay. So the, any immediate impact would be on some of the contemplation, perhaps of Snoqualmie Hills West of, uh, uh, it, it may take some development area off the table because of that buffer. 
I mean, that, that's... If there is any development area, a lot of these homes are built on smaller lots and big homes on smaller lots that don't allow for any significant expansion. No, no, I'm talking about on this Nokomi oh, Hills oh, you're Oh, okay. You're talking about the it, potential it, annexation area. Right. Potential yeah, it's all county property right now. Right, um, right. But um, from a development standpoint, if there were to be a development there, it would not be, it would be limited to being outside of that property. Correct. Okay, just to make sure. Yeah, correct. That. Yeah. Okay. Well, the good news is most of the potential annexation area is free of critical areas. I mean, it's not completely encumbered. Okay. Okay. All right. I think I understand it. Uh, thank you. That was informative. Um, wait, I see a question from uh, Vice Chair Tessman. Yes, I, I think it's probably for uh, Community Development Director Arteche. Is 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 this something that would be a mandatory disclosure like during the, the home buying process? No, no, it, it's, it's, you know, we don't place any notice on title. Um, you know, we, you know, we use the, the, the building permit process as our avenue to help determine whether or not, you know, they're building in a critical area or not building in a critical area. But okay, that being said, that being said, we, we could do some creative outreach. I mean, we could talk to the ROA and we could tell them, hey, buffer sizes are increasing and, you know, start, you know, doing some more extended PR, just letting people know. Um, shoot, I had another point in my head. I forgot it. I forgot it. Okay. Thank you for, for that. Okay. Jeff, thank you uh, for the update. That was very informative. Yep. And it took uh, the abstract and made it very specific. Good. And Commissioner Smith. Okay. I'm sorry, Commissioner Smith. Oh, we, we can't hear you. Pina? Weird. There you are. Here, you're back. Okay went to sleep uh we talk about it through the lens of like um well redevelopment or addition things like that but what about um would, would that also include i'm thinking i'm looking as i i really zoomed in on my screen here i mean somebody who maybe has just whatever you know initial pad that um was put in by the home builder uh, and they want to put on a you know a, a raised deck or a patio or a paver paver patio a thing like that i i assume those types of development would also would that be included or is that not considered under because that that could be a surprise to a lot of homeowners that who you know thought oh i'm just going to extend my extend my patio an extra 15 feet or something like that to find out that they wouldn't be able to yeah they, they wouldn't be able to we may not be able to catch everybody if they try to do something that doesn't require a permit um but if it requires a permit and you know it comes into our office we will inquire about where the critical area and or buffer is located before issuing a permit. Yeah, it, it, it would be interesting. I, I'm, I, I'm going to guess a lot of jurisdictions have gone through similar issues. Maybe there's something to be something to be learned from like the municipal municipal research services or some group like that of how they communicate changes um, in in the buffer distance. Um, to, to neighbors and I'm thinking of communities like Bothell and places like that where there's a lot of growth and development and um, cl houses close together lots of um, wetlands and areas like that maybe they've got some best practices because I I I could see it being a surprise I mean we, we we just saw this with the downtown residents of surprises of things that they didn't know maybe that you know they've been living um, restrictions they've been living under and I, I think we could end up with a whole lot of surprised residents just looking at that at the, I, I was surprised I zoomed in. It was only just 50 or so because it sure seems like there's a lot of impacted properties just on the ridge alone. Yeah, we could discuss, you know, maybe offline um, getting the ROA involved um, and making sure that there's good information from, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, City Hall to the ROA. I, I don't, my, my, my kind of immediate observation is that these properties are highly developed and they have very little to no ability to expand their footprints going no, you not know the house footprint but the deck footprint no, the, that is, that is sheds a, things like that yeah 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 folks definitely have built and expanded decks 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean. All right. We, I, I think we ought to uh, digest. Um, yeah. Since we have 150 folks, 150 plus impacted, uh, I think we ought to digest how to make some type of communication. ROA is probably probably the right place to. to ROA start. wants to be involved in things, so yeah. we yeah. we reach out to them and yeah, help ha have them help us transmit this yeah. information. Okay. Okay. And uh, Vice Chair Tisman, I see your hand is up. Yeah, sorry, I don't want to belabor this, but it is. Yeah, so two things: one, or maybe even three, right? So, first, would there be a waiver process? I just kind of want to throw that out there so I don't forget. Two, um, I know that you answered earlier that it'll be a comp. the The considerations would be a factor of linear feet yeah. of encroachment and square footage. So I, I get that. But when we apply that to the practical scenario of a standard home on Snoqualmie Ridge, right? Like if you look in that Silent Creek neighborhood there and along that trail, you've got, you know, your standard lots, everyone has a, a back fence or whatever. So my question would be, I don't think there's gonna be any heartburn from people if, you, if you're saying, well, the built environment for those homeowners, the existing built environment, goes all the way to that fence line and so they want to build a deck or whatever within their backyard contained by that fence line already built already existing that wouldn't be allowed with the expanded buffer no what do you think uh, if they're going to be building within the critical area buffer, it wouldn't be allowed, you know. Um, Even if it's within the fence line of their house, he said if, if the house is fenced back, and uh, and then the deck is you know, whatever they want to add fifteen feet to it, you're saying if it's in the buffer, it still wouldn't be allowed. I think that's his question. Yeah, I mean, you know, maybe there's some exceptions that we could consider um, adding into um, the development code. Is is Jeff still there? Jeff? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 So uh, there's certainly some ability for us to, you know, work with the tools that are in the code to say, hey, if you have an existing fence, you know, within, you know, newly newly expanded buffer, you know, you're able to keep it or, you know, there's there's some provisions that we could probably consider as extra tools. Okay. Okay. Well, I definitely think we should. Um, Reach out to the ROA as the next step. I don't, do you want to move that or is that staff? Can just do that? Staff can do that, okay. yeah. Okay. Chair, one uh, additional question uh, or just more of a food for thought for the next discussion on this. Um, any sort of impact, Jeff, on recreational land? So I noticed Centennial Park, we have Mount Side Golf Course, is also like well within the like buffer zone. Uh, any like improvements, enhancements, things they may need to do to kind of upkeep their facilities for the public, uh, would that also um, fall into issue with uh, uh, with this right here? So current uses like a golf course would be allowable. So say you have a back the the residential area has a backyard, you can still continue to mow the lawn, you can still continue to play in it, whatnot. Um, if for a golf course, you can still maintain the, the tees, you know, you can still do all of that. Um, so the continuing, the continued use wouldn't change. Um, but you can't, but then you wouldn't be able to say clear trees and realign, a, a golf hole. So, um, you know, that might be a little trickier, um, in the backyard scenario, um, you know, you wouldn't be able to, to, expand your lawn you can still keep your lawn you just wouldn't be able to expand it in the critical area so um you know i was just taking down a couple notes and we can work with director artechi about maybe defining what development is you know if there's an existing fence um you know what what you know does that define the development pr footprint in a residential area or something we can you know something like that the challenge is that residents residential areas 
are are generate a lot of pollutants, whether it's from from maintaining lawns, from yard, from you know pet waste, whatever it is. Um, so there, so it's a sort of in conflict in in the science. And in my twenty years of experience, this exact scenario, back decks on the back of houses. I mean, there have turned into neighborhood fights of people calling on each other because they try to do something, neighbor calls, and they find out that way, and it becomes very controversial. Um, so I think you guys are, uh, you know, spot on asking this question. Okay. I do think we should uh, reach out to the ROA and make sure that, um, I mean, since there is that quantity of folks affected, it's not like, um, you know, five or six. I, I think we... You got to figure out some type of communication. We'll do. Okay. All right. Um, yes, uh, Vice Chair Tessman. So I, I I know like it says that uh, one sounds like we we got to figure out how to do proper outreach. Two, uh, I know that the next steps outlined that uh, a proposed ordinance change would would be forthcoming, and so I kind of just want to get ahead of that and and say. Is my understanding correct, right, that these changes, the, the magnitude of these changes is not uh, what is specifically required by the Growth Management Act, right? We just have to review our, our critical use areas and, and associated ordinances, but those numbers are not driven by the Growth Management Act. They're driven by the best available science. Is, is that part accurate? Correct. Okay. And so... What I would say to that, as as we as we set the stage for considering this in, in subsequent meetings, is is it not viable? You know, uh, if, if we go with the if we go with the perfect solution, which is what the best available science is saying, which gets us potentially that ninety five percent reduction in pollutants, which is which is great, right? Which is ideal, but if we but that we know that impacts one hundred and fifty plus. Uh, owners, right? But if we were to maybe have the increase, you know, obviously we'd get less pollution reduction, but we'd also get potentially a dramatic decrease in affected homeowners. Uh, I would so I would offer that that's something this this commission should look at as as we consider this going forward. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Vice Chair Tisman. Uh, Commissioner Kilko? Yes. Uh, I'm, I'm just curious with regards to these buffer areas, if there's any precedent elsewhere where um, something I think that we're kind of discussing around, which is like if existing structures are allowed to be replaced without triggering the critical areas, as well as some kind of um, like threshold within where changes could be made um, to a certain extent, you know, if it's 10% of the overall square footage or I, I'm just making something up, but um, some kind of allowance that we could offer. So we're not restricting the, um, the landowners as much without hurting the critical area either, if there's any wiggle in there. <clears throat> Jeff, are you able to respond to that with any citations um, in the code that allow? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking. Is it existing um, legal nonconforming? Yeah, a lot, a lot of them are legally nonconforming. So, um, you know, I haven't seen any codes that have like a percent encumbrance versus developable area footprint sort of pathway. I think that'd be sort of not sure how that would be implemented kind of on a, you know, equally across properties. Um, but again, I think the tools are sort of, there's a reasonable use uh, pathway. There's a um, redevelopment within the existing footprint kind of pathway. Um, um, and depending on the activity, um, you know, it, it, um, it could be exempt. So, I mean, it can get it, um, it can get really sort of specific. So, say you convert uh, part of your lawn that's in the buffer to a raised bed, right? Everybody just wants to have a hobby in the backyard. Um, how that's interpreted as development or not temporary, permanent, 
I mean, nobody really wants to have to answer that, I think, and unless, you know, somebody reports on somebody else. Um, so, you know, I think we can work, you know, to try to find some kind of leniency for, you know, either residential areas or something like that. But, um, uh, but yeah, those, I think those are the pathways and the or mechanisms in the code right now. So. I mean, the, the the critical areas, you know, best available science is kind of designed to prevent and protect. So it's kind of working against expansion. Okay, I understand. So two things. So one, we're going to reach out to the RA, and, and maybe this uh, is what uh, Vice Chair Tessman was thinking about. And second is, is, is there any other, uh, you know, uh, municipality our size that dealt with this, and how did they deal with it? Is anybody ahead of us on dealing with this best available science and uh, communication? Is there some lessons learned that we could get from somebody else? Perhaps, um, you know, I think that uh, Jeff and I should, should go back and okay. and try to think about that that question. Uh, I know other jurisdictions like Sammamish, for example, um, it is um, stock full of critical areas wetlands, streams, steep slopes, er erosion hazard, landslide hazard. Um, and they, they do, um, you know, do, they do have some provisions in their code about expanding, you know, a, a residential use with a critical area and or buffer on site. And it's very, it's a very calculated way of allowing certain percentages um, and no net loss, and there, it's it's really re it's really tricky. Okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is going to be a big a, this is going to be a big deal for all jurisdictions, and we are ahead of the game by um, a landslide because we're starting this work early okay. um, and not later. I mean, a lot of cities might not want to do this and put that off until after the comp plan has been adopted, um, but they're all going to be facing uh, the same best available science, um, which as you know, from our work on the environmental element changed recent, recently um, with the redefining of streams to riparian and what riparian means and why riparian is important. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I just encourage all the commissioners to go back and look at riparian corridors um, and that best available science memo from the last planning commission to help understand why this area is so important. Yeah, that makes sense, makes sense. Chair, ask questions. Oh yes, uh, sorry, Councilman Johnson. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, in with regard to the idea of some sort of a building in an exemption of some sort for uh, residential uses, say you know a fifteen by fifteen square foot pad or something like that, um, being allowed, uh, I I feel like that can open up a can of worms in that. Uh, what people interpret as the materials that they could use could be uh, problematic. Uh, some materials that people might want to use could actually increase the amount of pollution. There are some uh, things like asphalt that I believe can uh, potentially increase the amount of uh, runoff of um, uh, not great materials. Uh, also, some surfaces are more permeable than others. Um, asphalt being more permeable than say concrete is my understanding um so that can have an effect on uh runoff uh and then the other thing is uh well in my mind what i envision is a flat cement concrete pad uh not all uh homes actually have a perfectly flat backyard some are sloped in some way uh so that could if just given a blank exemption for residential use up to a certain size someone might interpret that as oh great so i can actually make this flat which would require them to do some regrading which even just a foot of regrading means that you're displacing a volume of land mm -hmm. um and uh therefore a volume of runoff increasing um uh well, basically how much water ends up in your neighbor's yard. Um, so just uh, those kinds of concerns come to mind when we consider exemptions. Um, and that's just something that perhaps the planning commission could consider as, as, a, as an issue. A good point, very good point. Okay, all right. Again, uh, thank you, uh, Jeff, nothing controversial there. 150, yeah, the, the quantity of uh, folks affected, I think, uh, got us a little off guard there. Okay. Um, yes, uh, Jeff, anything else? 
I, I was just going to say one thing, uh, just a, an, a vote of encouragement that there, you know, there is flexibility in, in how to meet that best available science, just like how we're discussing. So I think the just the hard part is that we're starting out with such short buffer widths. So it's 75 feet, things like that. And then you have this guidance that says more than double that. So um Anyway, the, but there are creative methods, and so we'll look into that. Okay. Okay. Um, so at this point, I'd like to move on to agenda item number four, the comprehensive plan housing element policy review. Yes. <clears throat> I'm going to share my screen. Oh, that's of course got already best available science. Oh, sorry. Yeah, there we go. Um, so you have in your you so you have in your packet a memo um regarding a proposed new housing element policy. And you may be wondering, hey, Emily, we we finished the work on the comprehensive plan. And, and yes, the commission did a wonderful job working through over six elements um, over the course of one year, um, including the housing element. We also worked through housing needs analysis, middle housing, Valley-wide housing needs analysis, housing strategy plan, and housing element. Um, and to be brief, um, we are getting the, to the point where, you know, we're we're getting to adopt the comprehensive plan. And although the policy language was looked at before, it was reconsidered um, along with the back end of the housing strategy plan, middle housing, housing needs analysis. Um, and valley-wide housing needs analysis. And a comment came up recently in, in the past few weeks from Puget Sound Regional Government stating that, aha, the city should consider a displacement policy for housing. Um, dis displacement policy deals with trying to prevent and mitigate for unexpected loss of low-income housing and the residents associated with that low-income housing. Although Snoqualmie is considered at low, low, low risk for displacement, it was still encouraged that we consider a policy to address this particular part of the Puget Sound Regional Government's 2050 plan. So for that reason, I've included a draft policy on displacement. It's in <coughs> italics here for the commission to consider. And if, <coughs> if you choose to move this policy forward, it would be included in the new comprehensive plan that's going forward to the CED committee in, in late November, early December, and then would be adopted by the full council and move forward. And just to be clear, what you're asking is that we include the italics, consider partnerships with state and local agencies, community organizations, and the Stokomie tribe to find solutions that would reduce, mitigate, and or prevent displacement of very low to moderate income households or earnings up to 80% of the area of medium income. So it's considering the partnerships to address this. That is, that's what you'd like to be included in the, uh, would that be in the housing section? Yeah, and you the could, housing element yeah, of and the you, could, you could modify this language um, if you wanted to. Um, you could even, you know, consider adding, you know, any other cultural significant neighborhoods, not just the low income or up to 80%. But a displacement policy similar to this should be moving forward out of this commission to help 
ensure that the city's comprehensive plan gets certified but, but Puget Sound by regional. Puget Sound Regional okay. Council. Okay, because without this, it, there's a risk. I All feel, yeah, I, I, I was, I've, I've been informed there is a risk. Okay. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm certainly open to discussion, but I think this language is fine because the city, I think Bellevue would have a bigger problem with displacement than Snoqualmie would, and um, the partnerships allow us to to figure out how to address what Puget Sound is asking us to do. Because again, a, a city the size of Snoqualmie, I think is difficult. Yeah, I think it's difficult to think about in the same fashion that King County would. So, so anyway, I, I particularly like the language. I'm not sure that I'd add any consider points. This is what boost me. Uh, uh, so you're saying a very low or moderate income households earning up to eighty percent of very immediate income. Yeah, no, I, I I like the language actually. Any uh, uh, any comments from commissioners on the language? Don't see any any hands up. Okay. All right. Yes, Vice, some, Chair. Uh, Vice Chair Tessman. <laughs> Sorry, Chair. Um, oh, please go ahead. I just, I always, I, I try when we when we consider these things to to have a good grasp of, okay, like here we are. We're saying we want to do our best. We want to commit to partnerships that would ensure that we're preserving housing for low to moderate income households earning eighty percent of the area median median income. That's uh, it's hard to have a problem with that, right? But I'm just curious, uh, like how many how how many households would meet that criteria in, 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 in the city? Like it'd be, it'd be interesting to know that. And it would also be interesting to know if they're geographically clustered so that we can understand, okay, what are we saying? We're saying we're committing to partnerships in an effort to preserve this neighborhood and that neighborhood. You know what I mean? Maybe, maybe I'm the only one, but. Well, Good. I would just say you have to imagine in the future. So we, we have to imagine 20 years in the future. You know, maybe there's nobody right now, um, but maybe there could be. I mean, the city council is working on an RFQ for affordable housing right now um, at some of these AMIs. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, the um, the initial one, at first blush, I was thinking the same way. It was just like, why we just did all this work? Why do this? And the fact is, um, city of Snoqualmie, we need to, you know, listen to our larger entities and the Puget Sound Regional Council says you really got to do this or your housing is at risk. And we're going to word it as consider partnerships and how best to address it. I actually thought it was um, a, a good and judicious way to approach it. Now, how does that impact us today? Probably not. Um, 20 years from now, if uh, Council Member Watton and, and company, they get uh, something built, um, that, you know, I could see that happening, but um, at any rate, uh, I think it's necessary that um, we have a little bit of language in there, from what I understand. Yes? Yeah, I'd just like to, to mention that we, we do have Pickering Place, we do have Panorama, and we do have potentially um, some residents that would fit within this AMI bracket in the mill site. Hmm. And those, those are great tangible examples, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. Thank you. Thank you for the clarification. Okay. Um, at this point, again, I'm happy with that language um, to start the ball rolling and to get this in there. Is there any uh, any other questions or concerns by commissioners? Okay. At this point, I move that we include the language in italics in our uh, housing plan. Can I get a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Does that give you what you need? Yes. Okay. Well, we just have a full deck today. All right. Um, I'm going to move on to the next uh, agenda item, which is items of planning commissioner interest. Uh, so let me do the, uh, the round robin. Uh, Vice Chair Tessman. Uh, I just want to thank the community development director for helping me reset my password. So thank you. 
You're welcome. <laughs> and actually, one question since since we're since we're talking, I haven't received any outreach for that climate, uh, you know, committee or or uh, task force or whatever. Right. I just want to make sure I'm not missing anything. You should be hearing soon. I know there is a tentative meeting scheduled this month. Um, it looks like we're aiming for an early morning time, um, maybe at eight o'clock um, on on a Thursday or Friday. So I'll I'll um I'll reach back out to our climate change consultant, Chris Green. Yeah, different different guy. Yeah. Chris. Okay. So okay. thank you. I just, again, just want to make sure I wasn't messing up. So thank you very much. That's all I have, Chair. Thanks for volunteering for that, Vice Chair. Uh, good. Anything else, Vice Chair Tessman? No, thank you. Okay, Commissioner Smith? Nothing tonight. Uh, Commissioner Kilcup? I just want to say thank you for um, everything that was put together here. Community Director Artiche for keeping us uh, in compliance for our housing element. Just really, really detailed, diligent work um, to help make this easier for us. And I appreciate mm -hmm. it. You're welcome. Excellent. Uh, Commissioner Lambert? Yeah, is there any update on the, the work that's being done on 384 and whether or not they're going to leave that road in the shape that it's in until next year? I'd, I have to look into that and get back to the commission. I don't have an answer. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Murphy? Nothing this week. Okay. Uh, so I've got a, a couple uh, items. One is um, it is unlikely that uh, we'll have a commission meeting after December 2nd. Looks like that will be the last one of 2024. And that's also consistent, I understand, with uh, the committees, which, um, you know, the, the two weeks after that would be like December 17th. So, I, you know, that's, that's not going to be a date that's going to work. It's not going to work for me personally, but I don't think it's worked for the council either. So that being the case, I'd like to propose we do a potluck in person on December 2nd, where we all come up and uh, show our uh, food. Mm -hmm. And uh, remember that uh, blackberries are an invasive species, so be careful. Uh, <laughs> it's a joke from the last time. But uh, basically, um, yeah, I'd like to propose on December 2nd, planning commission, we have a potluck and we all bring some food. And actually meet each other in person if we haven't already. Like Mr. Murphy, I'll bet most of you haven't met Mr. Murphy personally. I'm sitting right next to him. <laughs> All right. Does that, uh, does that sound reasonable for everybody? Does that work? Personally, I will be out of town. Okay. When we tried this last year, I was the only one that showed up. You were there. I was there too. I was yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, that was awesome. Bring the salad, bring the salad awesome back. Salad. <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you what. Um, how about you, Vice Chair Tessman? Do you make it? So I'm returning from travel on the first, but I think it should be good. And so I anticipate I anticipate being there. All right. Uh Commissioner Smith. Yeah, same. I I think I sh I should be back um from from holiday travel. Thanks. Okay. How about Thanksgiving you? is so late this year. What's that? Thanksgiving is so late this year. It's it really is. throwing me off. Yeah. How about you? Uh, uh, I'll be there. All right. Excellent. Okay. I think uh, I've got to have a quorum. Krista Kokup will take pictures. You're going to miss a big, a big event. All right. And then we do have our November 18th commission meeting. And since that is way before Thanksgiving, which it is quite late, uh, that should proceed as, as normal. All right. And at a certain point, um, we can talk about um, does this time work for everybody uh, on a commission or whatnot? Um, that'll probably spill over until 2020. Five, but there certainly is, um, you know, some desire to, um, at least from from me and others, is to uh, do we make it easier for everybody to meet in person, and not rely so hard on the hybrid uh, courses that we've been doing. I know it's been helpful, but it's also helpful to to be in person where we can. So we're looking to see if we can prove that going into the end of twenty twenty four into twenty twenty five. So, okay, so we're gonna have a meeting on the eighteenth, meeting on the second. All right. Anything else? All right, then uh, upcoming schedule beyond what I just discussed. Is this what you're looking 
Yes. Uh, yes. So the future agenda list. Um, we have tentatively, I've got um, climate change committee, um, an update, introduction to wireless code and continued work and discussion on the critical areas code for the next meeting. Okay. And then we um, ought to close on the uh, clarifications on the historic downtown and uh, critical areas code. Well, the That's historic downtown as well, historic downtown retail. Yeah, we should carry that on to the 18th. And, um, or maybe even to the December 2nd, you know, as another discussion. I don't guess that, that one we'll have to feel our way through if we need more discussion on it beyond the 18th. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you all. Um, anything else, uh, Community Development Director Arteche? Okay, with that, I move we adjourn the meeting. Can I get a second? Second. Second. In favor? Aye. 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 Okay, meeting is adjourned at 8.41 p.m. on November 4th. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night, y'all. Good night.